hope again that you'll have this opportunity to take a look at this. You can go to our webpage, coronavirus.utah.gov, coronavirus.utah.gov, to get information and links to this new directive we're putting out here today. Let me just go over some highlights of the directive. And let me just emphasize, this is something we expect all Utahns to do. This is a directive to people of Utah. It's something that will only work if we all participate and do our part. Uh, there is no exception to this. So people say, well, it's for everybody else but not me. All of us are in this together. And if we do this, we're going to come out, I think, in good shape over the next few weeks. Again, some of this is a reemphasis of what you already know. Our directive, stay safe, stay home, which means that all individuals should stay home as much as possible. That ought to be the emphasis, but not to what can I do outside, but what do I do to stay home. Work from home whenever possible. I'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, encourage phone and uh, video chats. We have the technology today to help us with communication. We're, we're a social uh, uh, people, and so talking and communicating with people is an important aspect of keeping our sanity and our mental health right. We just need to do it in a more remote way. Uh, Self-quarantine. If you've been away or if you've been exposed to somebody who has COVID-19, then you should, of your own volition, self-quarantine. Again, help us stop the spread of this virus. Uh, we need to engage in what we call appropriate social distancing. That's the new part of our vernacular now that we're getting to use all the time, social distancing. It's the physical distance between you and an individual. It should be at least six feet. And so as we maintain that distance, we'll help, again, slow down the spread of the coronavirus. Not shaking hands with people. Find another way to greet them. Hey, bow. Uh, we've talked about touching elbows. Uh, maybe that's a way to do it, too. But we need to be just cognizant of the fact we don't want to have skin-on-skin -skin, uh, touching. Um, I know this is a hard one. You're going to have to cut down and not visit friends and family. I've talked about our thing for Sunday dinner. Uh, unless there's some kind of an urgent need, you just need to make that a change of your lifestyle for the next couple of weeks. Not attending any gathering of any number of people, uh, except for members of the same household or residence. So if there's a gathering outside, we have people that inadvertently start to gather at grocery stores, shopping center areas, and maybe it's not, it's more happenstance than by plan. But if that happens, you shouldn't disengage and disperse the group so that we don't have uh, in gatherings of um, a number of people together. Again, doing this will help us uh, slow down the spread. Again, some of the common sense things we've talked about with our hygiene standards, washing your hands, uh, making sure that you sing happy birthday to yourself twice is 20 seconds to washing your hands with hot water and soap, hand sanitizer, avoid touching of your face, covering up your coughs or sneezes. This is transmitted, we know more and more, by goblets. Uh, water droplets, uh, rather, and uh, that's how the people, in fact, get infected. So covering your coughs and sneezes is very important. Uh, we should, at our offices, our home, regularly clean uh, high-touch services, buttons, door handles, doorknobs, countertops, light switches, handles, uh, uh, chair rails. I mean, those kinds of things should be washed down and clean, uh, cleaned often. Um, Last but not least, we need to help others. Sometimes we need to just remind, oh, I can't shake your hand. I'm going to do the elbow touch or I'll bow. Uh, we need to wipe off the surfaces. Uh, we're, we've got too many people here to congregate together. Let's break in and disperse into smaller groups. We can all be a little bit uh, uh, aware and help others to become aware and doing our part to help others practice these same principles. A second category, which we want to emphasize that has not been emphasized enough, I don't think, in the, in the past, is high-risk individuals. High-risk individuals are people that are over 60 years of age. I'm one of them. That has underlying health issues, maybe some respiratory ailments and other things. But they're at high risk. And those individuals really do not and should not be visiting friends or family that, that does not have some kind of an urgent need connected to it. Um, do not interact with other high-risk individuals. We have a lot of social gatherings where it's just senior citizens. That's got to stop, at least till we get through this uh, 
urgency phase. Um, so do not interact physically with other high-risk individuals. Do not visit hospitals, uh, nursing homes, or other residential care facilities. Those people are vulnerable there, and that's uh, where you don't want to be either. Do not engage in recreational travel. Again, for our senior citizens and those who are in the high-risk category, the safest place to be is in your home. Stay safe, stay home. That's the phrase. Um, again, leave home only for emergencies and as infrequently as possible. You need to plan your days a little more. If you have to go grocery shopping, that ought to be not an everyday occurrence. That maybe is a once a week. If you can't get out, then the neighbors or other people ought to step up and see if you can find ways to help your neighbor and those who probably shouldn't be in the grocery store or around more people. Help them by getting groceries for them, delivering them to their front porch and, and ring the doorbell and then stand back six feet as they pick it up. Um, children, that's a uh, third category. Children, again, as you know, our public schools are closed and we would recommend that children should not attend school. I know there's reason to go pick up food for grab and go and get assignments. So those ought to be quick stops, quick visits. The clothes are officially closed until May 1st. Uh, we'll reevaluate at that date and see what happens in a month. But again, school, uh, uh, children should not be attending schools outside of their home. Uh, you should not arrange for play dates for people to come to your home and have a, a group setting with a, a bunch of young people playing. I don't know that's hard. It's not what we're used to, but it's something we need to enforce here for the next couple of weeks. And do not allow children on the public playground. That's a place where we can have enhanced transmission of the coronavirus. And so playground equipment and children playing there is a no-no. Um, food directories, directives, uh, let me give you some information on that. Again, we know that the hardest hit probably of all of our sectors of our economy is the hospitality industry, particularly restaurants and food organ opportunities. Again, we like to go out and socialize. Uh, it's, that's really what we, motivates us to go out and eat. Maybe not the food so much as it is just to hang out together. Uh, I get that. But for right now, do not dine out except for getting carryout and delivery, curbside service. We have many restaurants and dining areas that are making accommodations for this to happen. Uh, obviously, our schools are sending food home, and that's okay. But we just need to be careful in going to restaurants and, and dining in. Uh, we need to do more curbside and takeout. By the way, there is a, a challenge we've put out there called a 3T challenge. That means that all of us should try to find three times a week to do takeout. Go to your favorite place and get some takeout. That helps keep them afloat. Uh, I know that my wife just had her birthday, and she went out and wanted to go to dinner here a couple of weeks ago. But they and her girlfriends decided, let's just get takeout. And then they all bought a gift card for an additional time to help the restaurant stay afloat during these troubled times. That's a good thing that all of us can try to contribute to. If you're going to be outside uh, for whatever reason that's so, uh, essential, then maintain a distance of at least six feet from another person at all times. Again, that's part of our social distancing. If you're going to exercise, which is okay, you go out and exercise, you jog down the, ro uh, the road, walk around the block, walk your dog, a lot of different things you can be doing, hiking on a trail, uh, but maintain your distance of six feet from any other person and without touching any common areas. Um, do not congregate at trailheads. Again, that happens, and so we're saying to people, this is something you need to be cognizant about and avoid. No congregating at trailheads or other outdoor places. And uh, do not travel or participate in activities of any of these following locations, public amusement, parks, uh, where there's public activities going on, public swimming pools, or gyms and fitness centers. For right now, those are going to be off limits. Travel, we need to think in terms of only what we would consider essential travel. Uh, again, the thought process is what can we do at home without having to travel. Uh, but we know that there are times when you need to care for family members, health care issues. Uh, if you need to perform work and you can't telecommute, or do your work from home, which we hope employers will try to accommodate, uh, then you might have to travel to a work-related place. 
Again, we still would want the employee to say, uh, engage in safe practices to make sure that they are not exposing themselves to some kind of risk with the coronavirus. Uh, you need, may need to seek emergency services. We understand that. Uh, needs for health care, medications, donate blood, uh, you know, all kinds of issues regarding your health. Certainly those emergency services are okay. I've had it. people ask about leisure driving, and that's okay. If you want to take a leisurely drive for your mental health, you know, and you've got a, a, a car and a gas tank full of gas, you can do that. But we'd ask you to, again to, to think in terms of what can you do home first, but you can go on a leisurely drive. Um, we've talked about uh, the need to obtain food. Grocery stores and other kind of shopping centers are okay, but again, we would hope people would try to minimize their access to those uh, points by planning in advance. Uh, for the elderly people, maybe it's a little bit of a challenge. We'd ask for them to find people to help them, family members or friends that can do some of that shopping for them. We do note that many of our grocery stores and other uh, 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 stores are providing opportunities for senior citizens to come in at different hours where that's just for the senior citizens only, fewer people and a little less hectic and easier for them to get around. So, um if we're going to, we've got some programs we're going to help for those who are homeless, and Pamela Atkinson is going to help us coordinate those efforts with our homeless population, our friends there that need to travel from place to place to find shelter. And we're going to try to do that to make sure that we don't have any exposure there. The next category I've got is airports. Uh, again, we have concerns with our airports, uh, working with the Salt Lake City Mayor Mendenhall and the Salt Lake City Airport. Uh, some changes are going to be made at the Salt Lake City Airport when the, that only ticketed passengers are going to be allowed in the public areas of airports. If a ticketed passenger needs assistance, no more than one person may accompany that ticketed passenger. They've got to have a ticket, or it can be one associate with a ticket, but that's it. Individuals other than ticketed passengers must remain in their cars during the pickup and drop-off, which must be curbside or in the parking garage. That's what's going to happen at Salt Lake City International Airport. Uh, part of this directive is to have us work with all of our commercial airports, say Provo or St. George or Ogden, and take a look at what's taking place with policies there and see if we can emulate this same thing that's happening in Salt Lake City. So we're going to make it a little more restrictive for those folks coming into our airports, particularly from outside of our state. Um, I know outdoor activities and parks are a question, and certainly individuals may engage in outdoor activities. We've talked about walking, hiking, biking, uh, running, uh, hunting and fishing is okay. Um, there are some public parks that will work. There are some playgrounds that won't work that are in parks. So you can go to the park, but probably avoid the playgrounds. Again, these all need to be consistent with having social distancing, physical distancing of at least six feet, uh, from individuals one to another. Uh, again, no congregation at trailheads, at, at parks, or any other outdoor spaces. Again, there's a natural tendency for us to group together. That needs to stop. Um, state parks are only going to be available here in the state of Utah to residents of the county in which the state park is in. So we're going to have some slowdowns there, um, but uh, that'll help us control the spread of the virus, which is what we're trying to do. And so state parks are available only to residents of the county in which the park is located. The availability of our national parks is uh, in a process right now to be reviewed by us along with our National Park Service and the folks in Washington, D.C., and that will be made uh, available as soon as we have information on whether national parks are going to be open or closed. Um, Last but not least, uh, let's talk about businesses. Again, we are not closed for business. We are in a, maybe a, a little bit of a slower time for business than we've had in the past. We certainly know that unemployment requests are going up. Our unemployment rate has gone from the lowest in our history to around 5% now. We have our Department of Workforce Services, which is there designed to help people that have a need. They help them get on to unemploy, uh, in a, yeah, unemployment insurance to take care of their needs, but also to help them get a job. 
We have jobs available out there. They may need different training and education, but we will help them to get a, a new job and a new opportunity. So workforce services is a place to be considered there for anybody who's out of work. We also are working with the legislature, and we'll see if we have any programs to help with our business community that are needing a bridge to get through these troubled times. And so we're going to be working here on the, at the state level to see what we can provide, maybe in additional programs. We're working with our local banks. We know that some of our mortgage institutions have an ability for difficult circumstances to uh, uh, give you a, a grace period on having to make your mortgage payments three to six months grace and uh, help you get through again a, a tough time. We also saw that today that the federal government passed uh, with the House's vote now after the Senate already voted a $2 trillion relief package to help us in many different areas of concern throughout the country. Some of that money will be coming to the state of Utah and we'll be looking to see how to spend that money the most effectively that we can. Again, helping businesses stay afloat helping to give relief to individuals and employees and, and, and the public in many different ways and forms. So, again, stay tuned for that, but that's something that's going to be on the docket and will probably be coming into a special session in the next uh, short time, maybe two weeks or three, to, in fact, address that very issue as we come together with our legislature to, to have a special session to address that. Um, Again, let me just say to the, our, our business people, our for-profit as well as our non-profit, we need to make sure that you do everything you can to accommodate your employees. They need to know that they're coming to a safe environment. If they're sick, the presumption is that they're sick. This is not something they're faking. They don't have to have a COVID-19 get-out-of-work card. They should be able to be assumed that they're sick. We don't want them to be on the job uh, if they're sick of any nature. Uh, I've had calls from people that say, I feel good in the work I'm doing, but I don't feel good at the office. When I'm outside doing the work I'm required to do, I feel okay and precaution taking place, but not in my office at the home front. So we need to make sure that in all instances, our employees are put into an environment that will uh, protect them, that they don't risk their health. And again, we, we slow down the spread of this virus. Uh, there's opportunities to make sure that we, at, at corporate headquarters, we don't have groupings of 10 people. Uh, if we have 10 or less, that's okay, but they still ought to be spaced out. Let's make sure that we spread out our desks and spread out the office equipment so that we're not congregating during working hours, minimizing our face-to-face -face contract, implementing flexible hours. You can have different shifts. We expect our private sector to be innovative and find ways to, in fact, enforce the directive that we're giving out here today and still providing opportunities for their business to continue to, to uh, survive and uh, get through this troubled time and hopefully be prepared to thrive when we get through these next few weeks. Uh, we are open for business, and we want to maintain that opportunity as we protect the health and welfare of the people that we represent and those that we work with. All right, with that, let me just conclude here and just say, Again, these are directives that you'll be able to find on our web page so if you get the detail there. But as the governor of Utah, after having analyzed all that we're doing, what we're trying to do, and what we have still yet to do, uh, there's an expectation that all of us will follow these directives. And we need to do that. We need to do it in concert together. All of us need to work together if we're going to get uh, through this and survive and, 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 in fact, not only survive, but then be able to thrive in a few weeks. Uh, we have 13 regions identified by our local health departments. We have 13 local health departments. Some counties have one health department. Some counties have share a health department where two or three counties together. But we have 13 of them. And so we are expecting that those 13 different health departments in conjunction with their local elected officials, mayors, council members, uh, county commissioners, county council people, can work together and really, as uh, as is appropriate and necessary, let me emphasize, as is appropriate and necessary, uh, and, uh, different measures can be taken to enhance what we're given here today. So this is not a one-size-fits-all necessarily. If there are, in fact, needs to have some more stringent requirements, again, 
the local elected officials, work with the uh, local health departments. In conjunction with us on the state level, our state health department, there can be some modifications made to these directions here today. Last but not least, let me assure everybody that we are, in fact, collecting data, more so now than ever before. That's ramped up. Uh, the data, the science, the medical advice, the best we can find is what's going to drive policy. Uh, and this is not something we are just taking out of thin air. This is something that's been thought about and analyzed in great detail. That will continue. In fact, we plan to have, starting Monday, daily briefings, which will be available to the press so that the public at large knows what's happening, what the data shows us, and what is, in fact, informing us as far as what future policy it will be or must be. Uh, we think these policies we have in place, which are going to be effective immediately and will be in, in effect for the next couple of weeks. In fact, uh, I think I've got a uh, April. Yeah, these they'll be in place until April 13th, uh, and we expect everybody to follow them. If there's questions, give us a call. We're happy to work with you and explain them and uh, again, we know that there's uh, questions that will come, but uh, the data will inform us as far as what to do. We're going to have monthly, or excuse me, daily briefings starting Monday so we can keep the public informed on these issues. Uh, we'll uh, take questions. We'll try to give you good answers. Uh, your local uh, officials uh, and your local health departments as well as the state will give you factual information. There's a lot of rumors out there. We get calls all the day. Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? Uh, let's make sure that we deal with the facts and the best science, and the best medicine advice we can find as we get through this working together. So with that, we thank you all for your sacrifice. We thank you for your willingness to participate and follow these directives. And if we do so, this first phase of urgency will get through. We'll get into the stabilization mode, and then uh, we'll start growing the economy. And, and we can do that in a few weeks. If we don't do it, it's going to take us a few months. So I'm optimistic, very positive about the future. I think we're going to do this better than any state in America. So our future is bright. So thank you very much. We'll see if there's any questions now. Speak up loud so I can hear you. This is a directive uh, that's being given. Uh, the, the difference really is one of emphasis, a, a kind of reinforcement. Some of this stuff has been practiced. There's a lot of confusion out there as far as what's happening. So we're wanting to reinforce that if you want to stay safe, which most people want to be safe, then stay home. That's the, the place to be most of the time. We know that there are exceptions to that that are necessary and appropriate. And so we've tried to outline these and talk about you know, what is uh, appropriate and what is not. But this is kind of an opportunity for us to recommit to these common sense things and reemphasize what's been said before. Uh, again, this is the governor of Utah asking everybody to comply. Okay, to understand the question is why did I uh, you go this way, which is uh, stay safe, stay home, as opposed to a uh, shelter-in-place order, which has been done in other areas and locations, not only uh, around the country, but we had one here in, in Summit County recently. Uh, we think it's a little more uh, understandable. Um, what's the phrase, shelter-in-place? Uh, which sounds a little bit like a war, World War II effort. Uh, we're worrying about bombs coming. We think that uh, we have enough fear about this without adding to it, so we just think this is a better way to, to phrase it. Uh, we know that there are things that you can do. We're kind of emphasizing what you can do as opposed to your quarantine in your home for the next two weeks. 
We just think it's a better way to approach it in a more positive route. Um, we understand that, you know, the business and economics are essential. And so we want to do what we can to, to allow businesses to stay open if they meet criteria of keeping safety as foremost for their employees and making sure that they innovate and find ways, in fact, to, to make it safe for customers to come and for employees to work. Uh, if we do that, I think we're going to have the best of both worlds, which means we're going to have health protection. We're going to bend the curve, which appears to be happening. We'll know more in the, at the end of next week. But uh, the data gives us hope that we've gotten ahead of this quicker than other states. But we can't let uh, up now. We've got to keep uh, pushing this and reinforcing what we're already doing. And hopefully in a couple of weeks we'll find out that uh, our efforts are really working slow down the spread of the coronavirus. So that's why we're taking this attack, uh, this approach. If we find the data in a week is different than that, we'll take more aggressive approaches. I didn't hear that last part. The question, would the stay-at-home order help slow down the spread of virus and we could get back to work quicker? Uh, we're, we think we're doing things that are the optimal, where we'll slow down the spread of uh, the uh, coronavirus and still allow the marketplace to function it's even at some limited capacity right now. So it's not one versus the other. It's how do we do them together in concert to get the best outcome for both. Uh, we don't want to sacrifice people's health. Uh, we also know that a lot of the anxiety we're facing now and the calls we receive is, am I going to have a job? So we're trying to find a way, and I think the data shows, which is what's informing us today, and we'll see in a week from now uh, what has changed in the direction that the, the data will take us. Uh, but this was to allow us to protect people's health throughout the state, recognizing some potential regional differences that are out there, and yet have the economy continue to function. So I think that's the, that's the optimal place to be, and that's what we're trying to do. It does allow it in conjunction and cooperation with our own state health department. Uh, again, if they have issues that they'd like to address, we've talked, we've had conversations with both mayors, uh, and uh, we have a good relationship there, and I think we're striking the right balance here. Uh, I would hope that they would let us see what the data shows us over the next week before they do anything a little more harsh or more egregious. Uh, but again, we have allowed for some local control in conjunction with us if it's appropriate and needful. And so we'll see what happens with that, with uh, the city and with the county as we go forward. Mm -hmm. I don't think it does much uh, because I think as you read the Summit County order, which I think is uh, worded quite well, uh, there's enough exemptions in there from the order, the shelter-in-place order, that um, is very similar to what we're proposing here. We think ours is a little um, more pro uh, our proposal. the Summit County order and what we're doing here as a statewide, as a minimal uh, direction, is really much different. Uh, 
again, I understand the question. I didn't quite hear it, but it sounds like uh, what is the data that we're getting that's going to, what data would we receive that would make us change what we're doing now to something else? Um, I hope people understand that we are very much data-driven. Uh, I, not every area of the country has been as data-driven as we are. Uh, we think that's important. We have really smart people uh, that are analyzing the data daily. They're working virtually 24-7 around the clock and analyzing the data, not only here in Utah, but what we see around the country and other states and what they've had to deal with and how the results of a have occurred with what they've done, and literally around the world in other countries. Some have had success, some have not. So we're trying to learn vicariously from others' experience and then analyze the data and say, well, in Utah, this will work best for us, which has helped, to, again, to inform us as far as what our policies are today. Now, if we find a week from now, as we uh, track the data, we will, in fact, tell, it'll tell us whether things are working or not working. And if it's, if it's working, we'll continue uh, to do things and, and until we get to stabilization. If it's not working, we'll have to, in fact, reevaluate. It's like a football game at halftime. If we won the first half, we want to maybe do more of the same. If we lose at halftime, we, we may need to come up with a different game plan. But it'll be driven by data and the, and the, and the analysis that comes with that data as we, in fact, develop policy based on that. Nobody in the country is doing it better than we are right now. So that's why I'm optimistic, because I think we're doing things in the right way. We're not just hopefully putting something in place that maybe will work, we hope. This is based on good deep dive analysis, which gives us reason to believe that the policies we have in place, if everybody will participate in them, doesn't matter whether it's a law or just a suggestion. If people don't, if they ignore the law, things won't happen, at least in a positive way. So this is really a, a call to action for all of us in the state of Utah. This is something that we're asking everybody to participate. These are directives given to every Utah. And if we all work together, I'm very hopeful, very optimistic that we're going to get through this with minimal disruption economically. We'll revive quickly. And... Um, and we're going to be able to, to get to a good place. So that's the intent here, and I think we're in a good place now, getting to a better place tomorrow. With that, we thank everybody for their participation. Again, we'll be talking to you again soon. As I mentioned, we'll start having these uh, daily briefing on this issue, effective uh, starting this coming Monday, each and every day. We have yet to pick a time, but probably sometime mid-morning. So thank you very much.